Well, I want to continue sharing on God's gladiators, and we're going to look at the armor of God, and I'm just going to have to highlight this because I'm running out of time, but I have hours of teaching available in regards to these six pieces of armor because a, a good church and a good minister is going to be referring to these six pieces of armor in many different messages and topics because these are the weapons that God has provided for our warfare. These six pieces of armor in Ephesians chapter 6, they literally reveal Satan's wiles or his strategies against your children, against your grandchildren, against your homes, your marriages, your businesses, your destiny. Paul uncovers the strategies of Satan to defeat us and counters those strategies with God's armor and the spiritual weapons. And let me tell you, all six of these are weapons of mass destruction, hallelujah, in regards to the powers of darkness, in regards to demonic influences and presence in our current world, and many people yielding to these demonic powers unwittingly, you have to have wisdom on how to counter the weapons of Satan and darkness with the armor of God, the armor of light. So let's start again in, in Ephesians 6. Let's look at these six weapons. Verse 10, for my brethren, or finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or strategies of the devil. Now, how anyone can read that and not know God has prepared you to counter Satan's strategies and that he has a strategy against all of us is beyond me. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These things are real. You may not understand them. You may not discern them, but they are arrayed against the people of God. And you need not fear them, but you must be equipped to overcome them. This is what enables us to stand. Over the years, I've sincerely sought the Lord. Why, why do so many of our young people raised in church go off to college and in two or three months fall off the cliff, totally fall into the abyss and into darkness? In most cases, not all, but in most, in many cases, they were not taught these weapons of warfare and how to stand. And so they're falling all around us. Wherefore, take, you have to take it, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all, not some, not most, but all the fiery darts of the wicked. The devil has fiery darts that he's throwing at us, and we need to know how to quench them all. The shield of faith will do that. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then he talks about how we engage with these six weapons of warfare in our prayer life. These are the six things you should be praying over constantly. He talked about praying for each other. He talked about praying for him that, that he would speak the word of God boldly and make known the mysteries of the gospel. Man, if the apostle Paul prayed and asked you to pray for him to be bold, how many of you know I need you to pray for me to be bold? And how many of you know we've got to pray for you to be bold? Because there is a dogfight that's happening in our culture and most of God's people are in the dark of the, the cultural, if you will, war that is raging and that at large, at least in the natural, we're losing. We're losing an entire generation because we don't know what to fight, how to fight, or 
to even fight. And he said, we're not wrestling with people. Amen. Amen. I don't know how many times you have to say that for it to click. None of the things I say in engaging as a gladiator for God is personal or against any one person. If you'll even notice when I'm ministering, I talk about things in general because nothing I have to say is against a person because I love the person and God does too. And Jesus came to save them just like he came to save me and I want them saved. But until they get saved, what they're standing for and imposing on my children, I have to stand against. Hallelujah. That's called fighting the good fight of faith. And we're not mean, we're not rude, we're not harmful or will any ill will toward anyone. But when it comes to these principalities and powers, you can't be a wimp. You can't wimp out. When Satan throws these fiery darts at your children through social media, when professors throw these fiery darts, when these politicians throw these fiery darts at our families, at our children, at our, again, vocations. So what are these six weapons of mass destruction? What are these? And I, I, I tried to talk myself out of saying that because I guarantee I just got canceled on some social media sites. <laughs> Because I said weapons of mass destruction, and I'm not going to back off of it. We need in the church weapons of mass destruction against the strategies of the devil to destroy our homes, destroy our country, destroy human souls. We have even forgot that we're in a battle for the souls of men. And the devil wants you to be polite while he sucks people into the pit of darkness. He wants you to disengage from any warfare so he can suck people into the, into the obese. And, and we, have to, we have to stand. And after doing all to stand, we have to wrestle. I don't know if you've ever watched. I, I need to hurry. I've got to cover these six. But I just thought about wrestling. I grew up full-blown redneck in Florida, and all of my cousins and relatives, they were wrestling fans, they were addicted uh, to wrestling and the personalities of wrestling. And, and, and I can remember as a young person trying to, trying to talk to them and say, that's not real. <laughs> and they would get offended. I'm talking about, I'm talking about mad that it is real, and I'm going, it isn't real, it's preordained. The outcome is preordained, and, and yet how many of you know that you still have to go into the mat, the arena, and still wrestle, even though beforehand they've said to you, you will lose and you will win. You still have to wrestle, even though the outcome is preordained. You're not getting it. And you can tell it's preordained because the guy that was told you're to lose, when, when he pins the other guy to the mat, the referee, he'll, he'll fall down on his knee and he'll go, one, two, two, two. And then all of a sudden, the guy that was preordained to win breaks out of the the hold and just beats the snot out of the other guy. And when he pins the other guy down, the same ref goes, one, two, three. <laughs> I'm not saying these guys aren't athletes. I'm not saying they're, they're, they're not strong. I'm not say, saying they're not real bright. <laughs> I'm saying God has already preordained me in Jesus, the winner of every wrestling match I find myself in. And the devil's already been declared the loser, but I still have to wrestle. And sometimes, I mean, I'm looking at God going, are you sure I'm ordained to win this? Right? 
a battle for your kids, a battle for your health, a battle for your finances. Sometimes it looks like the other guy's going to win, even though God has already preordained you the winner. Thanks be unto God that causes me to always triumph in Christ Jesus the Lord. There's not one battle he threw me in that he didn't have confidence in me and declared me the winner before the first punch was thrown. And yet I still have to fight. I still have to stand. And you will not be able to stand effectively if you don't understand the six pieces of the armor. So the first one is the girdle of truth. The girdle of truth. Now, I spent some time on this before, so I'm going to have to fly through it to get to the other ones. But John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said to those disciples that believed on him, that's you and me. I need an amen. amen. Jesus said to those disciples that believed on him, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Whatever's trying to enslave you or your children, truth is your weapon of mass destruction against what? The lies of the devil. The real cultural war is between truth and lies. Satan is the father. Go to verse 44. He's the father of all lies and the way he enslaves your children your family, your friends, you at times, is through deception. He has no power over us. Jesus has stripped him of all his power. All he has is deception and lies, and you have to bite. You have to accept a lie in order to be enslaved by him. And so your, your weapon against his weapon of darkness, which is lies and deceit and fraud, is the truth. In, in that same chapter of John chapter 8, look at verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. You know, there's people today that talk about how polite Jesus was. And they got this picture of Jesus that I'm wondering, what Bible have they not read? Jesus is looking at these people. Supposedly God's people, the high end cream of the crop, the Pharisees. And he says, you're of your father, the devil. You know, I've been bold. I, there's been moments of weakness where the Holy Ghost came upon me and I have been super bold. But I've never looked at anybody and said, you're of your father, the devil. <laughs> I'm, I'm growing, hallelujah. I'm getting better. I want to be Christ-like. I want to be more like Jesus. He said, you're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. See, listen, Satan cannot abide in truth. If you're my disciple, indeed, continue. Abide in my word, truth, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Satan cannot hang out with truth. He cannot stand truth. He's not just against truth. Listen to me. Truth pains him. It torments him. He's not against the truth. He hates the truth. He despises the truth. And those who are of him, Anyone who gets close to truth, period, will come under vicious assault. I said a whole lot. He cannot abide in the truth. The truth torments him. It pains him. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. If you want to get rid of Satan, just speak the truth. Well, Satan's just on my back this week. Well, first of all, he's supposed to be under your feet, amen? What's he doing on your back? And all you got to do is speak the truth, and he can't stay. He can't handle it. Because there is no truth in him. There is no truth in him, for he is a liar and the father. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. 
Think about that for a minute. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, of his own character, of his own nature. Satan will always accuse others of what and who he is. That's why politicians under demonic influence, under the control of the prince of the air, and Ephesians chapter 2 said, you and I used to be dead in our sins and trespasses, and we were under the control of the prince of the power of the air. Aren't you glad you've been set free from the prince of the power of the air? But many politicians, not all, but many politicians are under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, and all they can do is lie, and they can only lie out of their own character that is demonic and they will always accuse others of what they are guilty of. That's a, that's a, you're supposed to mature. You're supposed to grow up and discern truth and lies. And the best way you'll learn what the lie is, is to know the truth. Then you recognize the lie. The biggest racist in our culture today that are raging war are full blown racist. It's in their heart. They can't see anything but racism. Why? They are racist. They can't see anything but color. That's the first thing they see. They can't judge, but after their own heart. Sigmund Freud called it psychological projection. You accuse others quickly and put them on the defense of what you know in your heart you're guilty of. And it is a weapon that politicians use. It's a weapon that those who love darkness and embrace darkness use. They will accuse others of what they're guilty of. And you can see it easily. This is what saddens me. If you can't see it in politics that's so clear, how are you going to see it even in the church that it's much more subtle? For four straight years, every day, Russian collusion, Russian collusion. While those accusing the setting president of Russian collusion were colluding with the Russians. And we're so blind and ignorant that we can't even discern it. We can't even see it. We don't even know the weapons that Satan and the only way he can destroy your life, destroy your health, destroy your children, destroy a country is lie, lie, lie. And when they lie, they, they press down on the lie. And in order to deceive even the church, they have to, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, and through verse 20, they have to suppress the truth. You have to cancel the truth. How do I know it's Satan working? Because he cancels the truth. And we're butt naked, we're naked. <laughs> I don't know if that was, I just, I don't know if I cussed or not, but. We, 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 haven't, we haven't put on, loved, embraced, felt comfortable in truth, period. I'm talking about truth, absolute truth. There's no such thing as your facts and my facts, your truth, my truth. That's the devil. That's a fiery dart that I see some of you, even your hair smoking right now. Because you just keep believing a lie upon lie upon lie. You've heard the lie. They're so confident in the lie. Why? They're of their father, the devil. Every lie is spawned from the pit of hell. When he speaketh, he speaketh of his own. I got to hurry. Bless my heart. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. See, when that fiery dart hits the heart of a human being and they embrace lies and deception, they reject the truth. When you receive the truth, put your clothes on, put your girdle on of truth, you, you just, I don't care who embraces that lie. I don't care what it'll cost me to reject that lie. I don't care who 
rejects me, uh, falsely accuses me now, calls me all kinds of names because that's my second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Your weapon of mass destruction against Satan's strategies against you is the breastplate of righteousness. Go to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. I quoted this last week, but it's just so powerful. I've never heard anybody say it this way. So the second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness of the heart. Girdle of truth is here. You have truth in your spirit. The girdle of truth connects all the rest of the armor together. You got to know the truth about righteousness, the truth about the gospel of peace, the truth about your salvation, the truth. So the truth connects everything else. It's your girdle. And in your spirit, you know the truth. Your spirit's born of the truth, of the word of God. And so in here, you know and recognize truth. You just have to learn how to discern your spirit versus your carnal unrenewed mind in order to be effective in good warfare saving your kids from this crooked and perverse generation. And so now the second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness of the heart, righteousness that comes by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. God's righteousness, not self-righteousness, not man's righteousness. breastplate of righteousness in order to defeat Satan, in order to win the battles and matches Jesus throws you into and he throws us all in different arenas. You have to understand you're made righteous by faith because what is the weapon of Satan of darkness is condemnation, guilt, and slander. Satan will always try to silence you by slandering you and accusing you. That's one of his titles. Satan has many titles. And one of his titles in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, is that he's called the accuser of the brethren. And that before the resurrection, he accused the brethren day and night before God. How many of you know you can read the book of Job? I'm in a hurry. This is going to go over some of your heads, but that's okay. But Job and the attack on Job by Satan, Satan, through the authority Adam gave him, had access all the way into heaven and could talk to God about Job. Anybody read the book of Job? Get a job. <laughs> you read the book of Job to all your kids, by the way. And... Jesus at his resurrection regained as the second man, the last Adam, all authority, he said, Matthew 28, in heaven and in earth. And Satan is the accuser of the brethren. How will he intimidate you? slandering you, condemning you. Who do you think you are speaking up? Who do you think you are? You've sinned. Amen. He'll, he'll accuse you. He'll slander you. That's why every debate I've ever found myself in, once those of the devil start losing the debate, they'll start calling you names. Why? They're of their father, the devil. Boy, y'all. This is good. I don't care how you're listening or not. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So as soon as I stand for sexual purity, he will call me a homophobe. Why does he call? He's a slanderer. Why does he do that? To silence me. So he can destroy your children. Are y'all still out there? I, if I had time, I could give a lot of good examples that would help everybody. In Isaiah 54, 
Verse 17, no weapon, everybody say weapon. weapon. We're talking about weapons of mass destruction. We're talking about what are Satan's weapons against you? As soon as you start standing up and speaking out to your children in any kind of public square, which social media is the new public square, and you talk about God loves everybody of every color and all lives matter, there won't be a fiery dart. There'll be an intercontinental nuclear ballistic missile launched from the pit of hell calling you a racist. Why would anybody call me a racist when I know and anybody that knows me, nothing could be further from the truth, to silence me, to intimidate me. It's a weapon of Satan. He slanders. He calls you names. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousnesses of me, saith the Lord. See, until you understand your breastplate and that your righteousness is by faith in the blood, that without Jesus, I'm no better than anybody else. Without Jesus, I would be as guilty of the most hideous sin you can make or mention without Jesus. And after the flesh, I'm still no good, but I'm not walking after the flesh. I'm not living after the flesh. I got dressed today. I put on the breastplate of righteousness and my righteousness is of God and your tongue of judgment toward me, I am to condemn. I don't condemn the people, but I condemn the words because words are weapons. And those of the devil know it when the church doesn't. And they will form weapons out of slander and guilt and condemnation and assault you to get you to back up, back down, and back out. And Satan has been very successful in this media revolution. We're, we're still in the midst of a media revolution that's greater than the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution changed the world. The media revolution is changing the world, but not for good. Because words are being used. You let your kids go on these social media outlets. TikTok is one of the worst ones. And there will be things said, bullying is happening all the time on social media to your children. And those words hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me. That's a lie of many. I'd rather be beat with a stick than receive the words of guilt, condemnation, shame that, that go deep and can wound your spirit. The book of Proverbs says words can wound your spirit. And as a parent, you have to learn not to condemn people. They don't know any better, but you got to condemn the words. I've had to stop and go, I don't receive that. I don't accept that slanderous accusation. Because if you meditate on the weapons of Satan long enough of slander, guilt, condemnation, you'll start to feel something. It's real. You'll start to talk yourself out of, you know, I guess I shouldn't tell my kids to live sexually pure. I failed. I guess I shouldn't tell them not to be smoking dope. I smoked dope. Don't look at me like that. You can tell by looking at me I must have smoked something. Amen. <laughs> Sue and I, Sue and I, we got a 22-minute drive. Well, if I drive it, it's, it's about 
22, 23 minutes. If Sue drives it, it's about 15. But we have a drive from Durant, the Durant Church to Kingston, and there was five bars in that, in that stretch in the middle of nowhere. And we'd pray against them in the name of Jesus. I pray you shut down. I pray people wake up to alcohol is not the way. And on and on we'd pray. We begin to see them close down one at a time. Finally, all five closed down. But now they're all pot shops. <laughs> Medical marijuana shops. People smoking dope, not even realizing they're the dope that's getting smoked. <laughs> oh, come on, let it go. We have to learn, yes, to be humble and to admit, yes, I was bound, but you don't have to be. And if you are, you can be set free. I got set free. Not celebrate it, not legalize it, not impose it on our children now. You won't, you won't, you won't last a day in this culture unless you put on the breastplate righteousness of the heart, righteousness by faith, that all have sinned. That includes me and come short of the glory of God, but Jesus has forgiven me, saved me, and changed me, and made me righteous and truly holy now. So I'm going to stand up for holiness. I'm not going to be condescending or self-righteous and look down on somebody that's committed perhaps something even I committed. No, I'm going to be merciful because I was once bound See, this is real simple. When you get your head out of the six o'clock news, you quit listening to the philosophies of this world. The second or third weapon of mass dis destruction, go to Psalms 28, is having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is one of the most highly misunderstood pieces of armor, weapons of warfare in the church at large out of all six, because I have never to this day heard anybody stand up and say what I'm saying. It is the gospel of peace that your feet are, be, are to be shod with, not peace. The world under demonic influence will demand peace. They will create ungodly governments, create chaos, so they can come in as the solution and keep peace. That's how Marxism works. That's how communist countries work. That's why I know the power of the truth. Every communist country has to silence the church, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. They have to burn the Bibles. They have to push the church underground because they can't lie and be empowered as long as people love truth. Now we're down to this peace issue. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells you that in the last days and signs of the last days... Verses 1 through 3 said that there will be world leaders that will be saying, peace, peace, and sudden destruction is going to come upon them in the day of the Lord. See, when Satan demands peace, that is code for compromise. See, to, to be at peace with evil to be at peace with darkness, to be at peace with that which destroys the human heart and the destiny of human beings around the world. To be at peace, you would have to unilaterally disarm your armor. See, the world will tell us and they'll, it's going to get louder and louder and louder. They'll, they'll say things like, if you people would just quit talking about sexual purity, there would be peace. You're creating the chaos, they'll say, by saying God has called us to sexual purity. 
God has called us to raise our children. You're responsible for raising your children, not a school board, not the FBI. I said a whole lot. Well, you'd let me be at a school board meeting and the FBI show up. I think I might get in the flesh. <laughs> Calling me a terrorist because I care about what poison you put or don't put in my kids. I care about truth, God's holiness, morality, virtue, character. And now I'm a terrorist? Because I refuse to allow the ungodly to defile my children's moral innocence? Amen. But they'll tell you every time, if you'll just shut up, there'll be peace. I don't know if y'all are getting anything out of this. or Are you getting something out of this? It's like, as soon as they ask me to compromise in the name of peace, I know that's the devil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak up louder. Amen. I'm going to stand stronger. Because it's the gospel of peace. The peace that you have to shod your feet with is that God is not at war with you any longer. And you'll never be effective in warfare if you think God is angry with you. If you think God is the one that's warring against you and punishing you and cursing you and... It's the gospel of peace that God has made peace with all of us through the blood of his cross. And God is at peace with you. Will you now be at peace with God? I'm at peace with everybody. I got no ax to grind. There's no hate in my heart. I'm at peace with everybody. <laughs> but not everybody's at peace with me. And they demand a peace of compromise. Just take your girdle off and everything will be fine. Amen. No, I'm not, I'm not stripping. I don't care if you put a pole up or anything else. I am not stripping for the world. <laughs> oh, come on. That was good. I heard that for the first time. Well, what's he talking about? Let it go. Let it go. Satan's peace is compromise. Look at, look at uh, Psalms 28, verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me. There's two judgments that are the worst judgments that will ever come upon the planet. One is God's silence. Not chastening you, not speaking to you, not showing you the way and how to walk in. His silence is one of his judgments. And the worst judgment of God that has ever hit this planet is giving you what you want that he has said, avoid. You can't even be given over to a reprobate mind till God gives you what you want. Romans chapter one says, please God, he's saying, please don't be silent Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. The worst, sil the worst judgment on even people is our silence. That's the only way Satan can drag them into the pit is through deception and lies. Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity. The context are and is the wicked and workers of iniquity. What are they doing? Which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Joe Biden got elected and Christians voted for him. Many Christians voted for him by the one statement of, I will bring peace and harmony. And he wasn't in office for an hour when the peace and harmony was over. Amen. 
They'll always say, peace, peace, while they're working mischief in their hearts. And the church has been so slow. We think that we're supposed to have on our, we just walk in peace. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm a peacemaker, and that's why I'm blessed. I live at peace with all men as much as lies within me. But my armor is not on my feet called peace. It's called the gospel of peace. Amen. Wow. All right, the fourth one is the shield of faith, the shield of faith whereby we will be able to quench all, not some, not most, but all the fiery darts of the wicked. Faith is what makes all of this work. And we're not talking about faith in theology, we're talking about faith in action. Faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. So you have to mix faith. Hebrews chapter four, verse two says, the gospel didn't profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. There are people that have heard the gospel and it didn't profit them. There's been people sitting in my services, our conferences, on and on we can go, and the message did not profit them. Why? They didn't mix faith with it. Amen. You have to mix faith with the Word of God in order for the Word of God to profit you. Mark chapter 16, it was Jesus that said, this Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible said in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized will be saved. He that believeth not will be damned. He wasn't being mean-spirited. He wasn't beating people over the head with that. He was warning people that, look, you have to believe, you have to mix faith with the word of God to be saved. And if you unbelieve, that's a death sentence. Faith is believe. What's Satan's weapon against us? Fear and unbelief. Amen. You have to put this stuff on by in prayer engaging with truth, engaging with righteousness, engaging with this gospel of peace that God has made peace with me through the blood of his cross. And God is for me. I don't care what's happening. God's made peace. I'm walking in peace. God's for me. All hell's breaking loose, but God's with me and God's for me. The gospel of peace. Sue puts all my clothes out on any kind of, of filming day, whether it's in the studio, on a, in a conference. Sue puts my clothes out. But she doesn't dress me. Some of you are still looking at me like, I thought you were the head of your home. I thought you taught us we're supposed to wear the pants in the home. Well, I do wear the pants, but Sue bought them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I wear the pants in my home too, but God tells me which ones, Sue tells me which ones to put on. <laughs> and she's not God. If I want to look bad in a filming setting, I can put my own clothes on. <laughs> God won't put these on for you. God hangs them out for you every day. And you just have to go, you know what? I'm going to walk in truth even if it makes me uncomfortable. I'm going to walk in truth whether my family rejects me, whether groups reject. I'm just going to walk in truth. Jesus, I love you. You are the truth. You are absolute truth and I'm going to embrace you, I'm going to love you, I'm going to kiss the truth, and I'm going to stand in righteousness by faith. I have no righteousness of my own, and I'm not battling in self-righteousness, but I've put on the breastplate. Lord, today, I just thank you for right. See, this is how you do it. You pray, you talk. I thank you today that you'll help me stand for my children and protect my children from against what is unrighteous because I've put on the breastplate of righteousness. I thank you today that, man, the gospel, I'm going to, my feet are beautiful. I get up every morning and say, man, I got some pretty feet. Beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things, that share the good news that Jesus loves you. And he loves you just like you are, but he loved you too much to leave you the way you are. He died for who you are and what you are and was raised from the dead so you could be all he ordained before the foundations of the world for you to be blessed, righteous, and holy, sanctified, justified in God's eyes. Hallelujah. Will you believe? Yes. I'm walking in that every day. And man, I got my shield up and man, these fiery darts 
That shield, believing God, trusting God, acting in faith will quench every fiery dart of the wicked. And I've got my helmet of salvation on. Your salvation is supposed to permeate your thinking. Look up the word salvation. It means healed. It means delivered. It means made whole. But it's not automatic. You have to think on your salvation. You have to put on the mind of Christ, not the mind of the Antichrist. And yet many Christians, even at church, have got a false helmet on and their mind is more set on the philosophies of men and the Antichrist than the philosophies of God and Christ. You have to put on in your thinking the mind of Christ. You can't keep being carnally minded and experience anything but death. You have to be spiritually minded in order for the life and peace of God to permeate your being. You can't keep thinking like you used to think and like the world continues to think. Why would anybody go to church? Why would you get up and get these kids dressed to come hear me sound like a six o'clock anchor? Why would you go to all this trouble to even be here so I can tell you what you think you already know? That didn't fly. I want to know what God thinks. I want people to come to church and care what God thinks. Amen. And then the last one, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the Word of God, not on the pages or in your gadget. It's the Word of God put in your heart and spoken out your mouth. This is how you defeat Satan. Jesus modeled it in Matthew chapter 4 on the Mount of Temptation. Satan came at him and came at him and bombarded him. And how did he respond? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 8. He quoted the Bible and he didn't just quote it from head knowledge. He spoke it as a sword. Go to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. Look at verse, I think it's 16. This is one of the churches of the five in Asia Minor. And think about this, five out of seven churches, Jesus had to tell them to repent. Repent there's not talking about all of you are lost, come down to the altar, cry and Cry out to God to save you. They were saved. But he said, I've got ought against you. And you need to repent, which means change your mind and your direction. And some of the things, I tell you what, I taught this. I taught on these seven churches, I bet, 30 years ago. It's called the end times. I don't even know if we have it available. It was on cassette tape. And I went through all seven churches And the five that had to repent, what they were doing is happening today in probably five out of seven churches. Amen. Amen. That just saddens my heart. You know, everybody talks about, let's get back to the first century church. (laughs) As if these people were pure as the wind-driven snow. They had everything and their act together. No, seven of them, five. He said, if you don't repent, I'm going to put out your candlestick. I'm going to shut your church down. The devil's not the only one shutting churches down. Come on, get dressed, get dressed, get dressed. Hallelujah. Got that girdle on. Tighten it up. Hallelujah. My belly was hanging over. (laughs) Revelation. Can I just say it this way? If Jesus shows up, and I won't doubt in this third great awakening that Jesus won't appear in many places throughout this country. Well, that that didn't go very big. 
All I know is whatever church he sends me to and I'm ministering in, if he shows up and appears, he's here whether you see him or not. He's watching whether you know it or not. But if he appeared, I want to be one of the two out of the seven where he goes, man, y'all are doing a good job. I'm proud of you. You're loving people unconditionally, but you love them more than yourself and you're letting them know the truth, but you're speaking it in love and, and millions are getting saved and others are, are breaking demonic powers off of their families and generational curses. Man, you're doing a good job and walk off. Not start off with that sandwich technique. Hey, you guys are awesome and you've done a good job. However, you're teaching my people to commit fornication. It's in there. Teaching from the pulpit. Fornication's okay. Amen. It's going on all over the country. Okay. Thank God I'm running out of time. Oh, I'm in the red. This is when it's good. Hey Amen. There's a little bit better response over here. Let's go over here. Revelation, let me, let me, I, I took too much time. Revelation 1, 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. The seven churches were in his right, his right hand. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in, his, in its strength. A two-edged sword's coming out of his mouth. Look at Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Verse, verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. Look at verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. How does Jesus fight against them? With the sword of his mouth. Man, we could just spend, we will. For the five or six hundred that come back, I always say five or six that comes back and Sue rebukes me in the car. <laughs> so for the five or six hundred that come back, there'll be times we'll have to deal with the word of God and the power of God's word and how it's alive. And when it's put in your heart and spoken out your mouth to mountains, to Satan, it pains him. He's a spirit being. God's word is spirit. Jesus said, the flesh profits you nothing. My words, they are spirit. And like God's word, when it comes out of your heart, when it's put in your heart, not just like a parrot saying it, but it's in your heart and you speak it. It's a sword. It pains him. It sticks him. It cuts him. Jesus bombed him off the mountain with the sword of the Spirit. It is written, it is written, it is written. Three times he endured, three times it is written. And after the third time, he left Jesus alone. <laughs> he bombed him off that mountain with it's written. Teach your kids what is written. Teach your grandkids what is written and how to speak to your mountain, what is written. How to speak to principalities and powers, what is written. You'll see victory in your life. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for dressing us or making available a wardrobe of weapons of mass destruction. You told us to put it on. We do that by faith. Lord, I just thank you that you're raising up truly an army of believers. Help me to make it simple. Help me to communicate it that a generation might be saved from all these principalities and powers and wickedness in these high places. That people will be saved in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Help us to shine as lights, lights of hope, lights of faith, lights of victory over our flesh, over sin, 
Satan and the world. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord praise.